I grew up in a very insecure family. Now, what I mean by that was I, our family unit you know, really did put the word fun back into dysfunctional. And I, growing up in our family with my mother, I, some of you know the story. I mean, she had me when she was 16. They were married just before they had me. They were divorced when I was four. She remarried when I was nine. He adopted me when I was nine. They were divorced when I was 16. I've got two brothers from that marriage. She's remarried a third time. And I mean, it's a real struggle to look back over my life and say, where is my anchor of security? Was my grandparents who raised me till I was nine. There was a little bit of anchor of, secu- of security there. But I grew up extremely insecure. I've noticed one thing about two people or two kinds of people that come out of insecurities. Number one, they're either extremely outgoing. I really. They're either just showboat person. And and that's that's what drives me in some respects. And then there's the, the insecure person who doesn't want anybody to notice. Now, what that drives us to do is... The showboat gets up and says, hey, everybody, let's get together and let's all have a good time. And I really want you to like me. The insecure person says, would you, now you're going to think this is funny, but watch. Would you please notice me and draw me out? Would you please notice me? Would you please notice me? Would you please notice me? Same source, insecurity. What is it, though, that leads to Insecurity. It's that feeling that I don't really have any real value of myself. My self-esteem, my self-value is it, gone. I don't have any. My, my value is in your praise or your noticing me. Either way, it's wrapped up in what other people are thinking or saying or doing toward you. Are you with me on this so far? So my insecurity is rooted in two things. Lack of value and a lack of a sense of commitment to me. Nobody really cares. Nobody really is concerned. The only time they're concerned about me is if I'm sick. Now then I get a lot of attention. As a kid, I was sick often. I would take the thermometer and hold it to the the vent. When my mother sees this, she'll know now what I did. I'd hold it to the vent and raise it up to a certain level that I knew that if it was too high, she would take certain actions. (laughs) I didn't want because I wasn't really sick. And I knew that if it was too, if it was normal, I'd have to go to school. And I wouldn't get the extra attention. And it wasn't a, I'm going to think this thing through and do it, except that this trick in order to get out of going to school, in order to not have the assignment that I didn't do, but also... I got extra special attention when I was sick. And I wonder if maybe I was really sometimes feeling pain and illness if, if that was because I could get a little extra attention. So, okay, you know a little bit of my background. You know, maybe that was what was stirring that up. And so to this day, you're going to say, are you really sick? You just want attention. Insecurity is resting in lack of value and lack of commitment, the feeling of commitment. Does anybody really care? I want to know if you care. Please care about me. You get the point. So both angles, both expressions, extreme expressions of the same, I'm going to call it a dysfunction, this great insecurity. But the insecurity level is, the insecurity level is this. The greater the insecurity the greater the seeking of value and the greater the need for care. So I become a little Yoda. Mine, mine, mine. Remember that from the first or from the second Star Wars? Whenever Luke met Yoda. Mine, mine. (laughs) I'm sorry. Mine. Like it, I do. Okay, (laughs) What's this got to do with anything? I know what you're asking. And 1 Corinthians 13 says, love is patient, love is kind, love is not jealous, is not rude, does not brag, is not arrogant, does not keep a record of wrongs, does not rejoice with evil, but rejoices with what is right. Love bears all things, hopes all things, believes all things. Love never fails. Love, the centerpiece of love 
first centerpiece of healthy 1 Corinthians love, 1 Corinthians 13, is God. He's center. He's Lord. Chapter 12 established that. And if you miss it in chapter 12, read the first 12 chapters. Jesus is Lord. The crucifixion and resurrection places him there. You're not. He is. Love him with everything. And, and if you're seeking out knowledge and you express knowledge, well, what does that do? What puffs you up is what it does. Makes you feel more important. Some people really put the knowledge foot out. Notice how much I know. Other people, maybe it's not knowledge, maybe it's talent. I put the talent foot out. Let me tell you about the things that I've accomplished. Let me tell you about the things that I do. Would you notice that I can throw that ball a little further? I can run a little faster. I can jump a little higher. I can, I can produce a little more. I look at my kids. See what, how good they're doing. Notice what I'm doing because of my kids. I have all these kids. And this is, this is where I put in all my energy because this is where I get my value. Now watch carefully. Not, all, not everyone who has a lot of kids, not everyone who is an athlete and does all those things is insecure or selfish. But the reason we brag about those things is because we're hoping someone will notice and care and value us more. We're in a generation that appeals to the highly narcissistic. Thus, in the Facebook, we have a whole lot of selfies and a whole lot of fingernails, and a whole lot of toenails, and a whole lot of weight loss, and a whole lot of, a whole lot of us. A Facebook appeals to us a lot because it's all about me. And let me show you what I'm eating today. And let me show you what it did to me today. And let me show you, what, let me show you who I'm hanging out with. Because you see, this person likes me, and so that must make me valuable because... And for some countries that have been downtrodden or third world, they are the ones who have the most selfies. By population, by percentage, very interesting. But what are they looking for? Hear the words. Please notice me. Okay, now what's this got to do with jealousy? And then what does that have to do with keeping a record of wrongs and bragging and arrogance? It has this to do with the whole passage Love is selfless. Impatience is selfish. Unkindness and demanding your own way, raising your voice. I'm sorry. When I get carried away, some of you think I'm angry at you. I'm not. I'm I'm angry at me because as I'm preaching, sometimes I'm preparing and I'm thinking of you. A couple of you anyway. You know, somebody said, I feel like you've been walking around following me all week. Man, I mean, how did you know to preach on that? Because I've been walking around following you all week. And listen, people are texting me all the time about you. And they're telling me material that I can fill in so that I can preach just to you. Because after all, the whole universe is you. And the Facebook was designed for you, and so are my sermons. So obviously, I've been following you around. You got it, right? You followed me on that one. A little satirical, but hopefully it hits you. Now here, I, I, I'm not preaching to you. I, I think about you, and honestly, some of you I didn't think about because I didn't know you were going to be here, all right? I mean, I knew you were going to be here, but I never met you before. Cameron, or, I mean, Iran. <laughs> we got this thing going on. He, I call him Iran, and he calls me Vin. Okay. Never forget him that way, though. Right, Aaron? All right. I didn't know he was going to be here, so I didn't preach to him. The rest of you, I know, are going to be here. And when I'm thinking about and preparing my lesson for you, I am thinking and praying for you. Sometimes in my mind, I come and I sit where you basically sit. And in my mind, I think, how are you going to receive what I'm saying here? What can I say and how can I say it in a way that you're going to hear it better? And some things are sugar-coated, so you can swallow it a little easier. And some things, I'm thinking, okay, I've got you ready. Your defenses are down. Boom, gotcha. And you're saying, whoa, that really hit hard. Now what can I do with this? And some of you hear new information. You're saying, well, that doesn't apply to me. But it applies to, and so you're thinking of somebody else in the building that it applies to, but not to you. You know what I mean? You take the lesson and you apply it to everyone else. Listen, I'm not speaking to the person down the road from you or the one up front or the one in the back. I'm not preaching to the people who aren't here. So don't sit there and say, I sure wish that she were here because she needed to hear that. I really wish that he were here because he needed to hear that. I'm speaking to you. 
And I'm thinking about you and I'm preparing this. So I'm saying all that to say this. While I'm preparing, I'm thinking of you. When I'm preaching, finally I wake up and I say, you know, this applies to me. And it just makes me more angry. So if I sound angry, I'm not angry at you mostly. I'm angry at me. Because I, as I'm preaching and as I'm studying, I see how far I am from. But there are a few things that I'm learning and gaining some, some ground on. I'm growing. And I'm becoming less selfish because of the study of this passage. The heart of this passage is others. Love is patient. Why? Because you put up with and you wait for others. Why? Because you're not in the center and other people don't have to live the way you think they do or do things at the timetable that you have. It is their life with respect to God and you're patient. Love is kind. Okay, that has to do with others. When I'm kind, I look at you and I say, what do you need the most? And I try to do that in a gentle way. Well, if that's gentle, then I'd hate to say it if you're really rough. Love is kind. Now look back over your, your relationships and think in these terms. Who have I had the greatest degree or expressed the greatest degree of impatience with? Who have I been most unkind to, either to their faces or in private conversations? Because I can be nice to your face and gentle ah, and eat you alive alone. And some of you after church on Sunday, you go out to eat and you have roast preacher, and I know it. That's all right. <laughs> but what's, what's the point? Other-centered, God-centered first, other-centered, and then if there is anything left, you take, but it's only because it's left. Well, that doesn't sound like value to me. Watch. Here's extreme value. You and I are equal, and I deliberately choose to be your servant. That's humility. Okay? Self-deprecation, putting yourself down, having a zero self concept is I start here I have no value you have greater value I start there that is not biblical that's not Jesus have the same mind in you that is also in Jesus Christ who being equal to God did not he being in the form of God did not account equality something to be grasped but what did he do emptied himself I'm quoting Philippians 2 by the way if you want to read it Philippians 2 verse 5 Have the same attitude, the same mind in you that's in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, equal with God, did not account equality, something to be grasped, but emptied himself. What did he become? A servant. He took on the form of a man and became a servant. To what degree did he serve? To the point of death. Really? He died? That's pretty far from the glory of heaven to the dead man. Oh, wait, wait, you haven't heard it all. Even death on a cross. Have that mindset in you. And having done that, God raised him up above all. And so that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue confess Jesus is Lord. It's going to happen. So let's do it now. Bow the knee now and make him Lord. And watch what happens to the rest of your life when you work the lordship of Jesus in every area of your life. So I'm more patient now because I'm other-centered, because I'm Christ-centered. I'm more kind now. I'm growing in this. Is there anyone here that's perfectly kind? Anyone here that is extra patient? I mean, perfectly patient. Anyone here who is not arrogant at all in any of your life and you never brag about anything that you do. You don't, you're not jealous. Well, you say, last week I touched about jealousy, but watch what happens in insecurity where I don't have any value and I don't have any feeling of commitment to me. Nobody really cares. Watch what happens. I'm jealous of other people and it becomes an obsession so that all I'm thinking about is who is he with, who is she with, what are they doing, Why aren't I doing this? Even with children sometimes, it's like the dad is jealous of the children 
because they're taking time away from him. Or the wife is jealous of the job because it's taking time away from her or of somebody that he's spending time with. You say, but aren't there appropriate times to be jealous? Yes, zealous, earnestly desiring the other person and wanting to be the only person in someone's life in a marriage relationship. Look, that's healthy. But to sit around and worry what's happening to the spouse, unless there is real reason that you got for that, but to sit around and check and wonder and call and... That, that's a sense of control. That's a sense of demanding. That's a sense of insecurity. But worse than that, let's go beyond that. But there's some people in my life who have tremendous abilities that I wish I had. And I'm jealous of them. Envious of what they have. That's the negative phrase of jealous. Love is not jealous. It, it's that I am not very valuable, but if I had that quality, people would admire me like they admire him or her. So I have two options. I can develop that naturally, I can work on it and become better and let that drive me, or I can sit back and say, man, I tell you what, I can't stand that person because everybody loves him, everybody likes him, everybody wants to spend time with him and not with me. You see the difference? And I wish I had it, but I don't. And so envy is, a, is an outgrowth of coveting. I want what you have, but I'm not willing to work for it legally or, or make it my own. I want to take what you have, or I'm envious of what you have, and I covet that. There's an illicit desire for something that is not mine. Coveting. That's the idea here in love is not jealous. So far, does that make sense? Are you with me? Okay. Then let's look at the next phrase, because I believe that if we could work on, on the root, we're going to find this other a whole lot easier to apply as well. Let's look at what it says in 1 Corinthians 13. Go back to verse 4 with me, and we'll get it in this context. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy is not jealous, or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. Now that phrase applies to every part of what Paul has said so far. Does not insist on its own way. He's writing to a church, folks. He's writing to a church of people who are self-centered, who are extremely insecure, and who feel like, if I only had those gifts, I would be noticed more. I would be seen as more important. I'd have more power, more authority. They were misusing spiritual gifts from their own insecurities to gain value and commitment from others. Love is not jealous. I almost forgot this again. I want you to get verse uh, 13. No, I'm wrong. What's the last verse of chapter 12? 31, reverse the numbers, Kev. That's called numeric dyslexia. 31. Translation in verse 31 of chapter 12 says this, but earnestly desire the higher gifts. I will show you a still more excellent way. Pause. Chapter 14, verse 1. Pursue love and earnestly desire the spiritual gifts, especially that you may prophesy. Now, if you read the rest of chapter 14, you'll recognize prophesying is for the benefit of everyone. In contrast with speaking in tongues, which would benefit the individual, unless there's an interpreter, then it benefits everyone, and that's the original intention in the assembly. It's for the benefit of others. Your gift doesn't benefit you, it benefits others. Don't seek your spiritual gift so that you'll be noticed or that it would benefit you. Seek your spiritual gift so you can benefit others. And in the tongue-speaking time of the church, if there is a tongue-speaker speaking and there is no interpreter, sit down and shut up. It's not helping anyone. It's just confusing matters, especially if you're all speaking in tongues because it just draws attention to you and it doesn't help anybody. But if there's an interpreter, then everybody benefits. Now, here's what really benefits is speaking in words that everyone can understand. That's prophesying. 
fourth telling. And everybody is saying, that makes sense. And you guys, that reveals something about my heart. God is truly among you. And they fall flat on their face and they worship God if there's an unbeliever. If there's an unbeliever and everybody's speaking in a language and nobody understands them, people are going to say, you guys are crazy. <laughs> I don't want to be back here again. So, how's that translate in our language? Speak a similar language and lift it up for God and, and be understandable. Then why are you preaching, Kevin? Good question. All right, last, last verse I want to draw your attention to is, see, earnestly desire the gifts. For what reason? Because prophesying helps others. Watch. Next to last verse of chapter 14. So my brothers, earnestly, this is verse 39, earnestly desire to prophesy. Don't forbid speaking in tongues. But all things should be done in Decently and in order. We have decently and ordered ourselves nearly to a rigidity that is, as far as our history is concerned, we just need to lighten up a little on that one. But here's the point. Earnestly desire is mentioned in chapter 12, verse 31, chapter 14 and verse 1, and chapter 14 and verse 39. Is the term earnestly desire there positive or negative? It's a positive use of the word zeleo, which is the exact same word that's used in chapter 13 and verse 5. Love is not zeleo. Now I'm really confused. How can he say earnestly desire these things and then says love does not earnestly desire well, obviously, the word zeleo means something different in chapter 13, verse 5, than it does in chapter 14 and chapter 12. In the same way that last week I indicated, the word wicked means something different in each context. Or the word bayad, as you say down in Texas, bayad. He's really bayad. That movie was bayad. You mean it's good? Yeah, it's good. It's bayad. Bad. It's cool, man. You mean it's frigid? No, it means, I mean it's good. Man, that was hot. You mean burn it up? No, I mean, it was really great. So words don't mean the same things. What makes a word mean something? The context, the relationship. Look to those. So the immediate context of chapter 13, love is not zeleo, obviously is not the same as you must zeleo different kinds of gifts. Earnestly desire. Love does not earnestly desire. That is, love is not wrapped up in itself and demands its own way. Earnestly desiring that everybody fit my timetable and do things in my way, and if you don't, then I'm just going to take my marbles and leave. To take, boy, I tell you what, if that church, if they do that again, I'm going to take my two dollars and I'm going to go to that other church. If you're that shallow, maybe that's better. I mean, really, if you if you're that self-centered. And if you're not looking to the benefit of others, and you're not trying to help others come to know the Lord, then, then maybe, maybe you would fit better in another place. I don't know. I'm not going to hold you back. But would it be possible that you don't demand your own way? And that, that if you do, that's got to be this way, that it's not just for your benefit and your own comfort or your own pleasure. Well, I like it better when we sing these kinds of songs. Okay, thank you. Do you demand that? No. What's to the benefit of all? What, what will help reach people? What is going to help draw people to come? Well, those songs won't help me do that. Don't help me do that. Really? And so now it's back all about me. Be careful is what I'm saying. Okay, so love does not keep it a record of wrongs. Is that possible? No. We all have memories. And so, but do I keep a record of wrongs? Well, if I'm really loving, I'm growing in my maturity, I'm not keeping a record of wrongs against you. That's the idea. It's not that you don't ever remember what people have done against you. It's that you don't hold against them anymore. You're not, the record of wrongs is you can't help but remember what she said, what he did. You can't help it. It is part of your makeup. Unless you had the blessed peace of not remembering anything at all, And that may be a gift for some of us, quite honestly. 
I don't know if you've watched uh, 24, but when the president is entering into a stage of Alzheimer's, at the very last stage of 20, it would be a spoiler to you, his daughter is dead, and he's standing next to the prime minister of London who loves this man, and he looks at him and says, Jim, I'm so sorry. And he says, you know what the best thing is? In a little while, I won't remember any of this. I thought, what an interesting perspective on Alzheimer's. It's a gift for some people. Maybe. I don't don't know. I don't know. I'm just throwing that out. Okay, here's my point. Keeping a record of wrongs. If it eats you alive to keep on thinking about something and someone, may I suggest to you one of two things. Stop thinking about it. But that's not going to work because you can't stop thinking about something by trying to stop thinking about it. So you need to reframe it. You need to look back at it and look at it differently. How do you look at what somebody has done against you differently? They did it. It hurt. And it was painful enough that it, you felt justice had to be done. What do you do with that? Take the person and the item and see that, see the person, nailed to the cross of Jesus. And let them go. In the name of Jesus, I forgive you. I will not hold this against you any longer. Let him hold the person accountable if there's any accountability to be held. You cut them free in your heart. Because if you refuse to forgive and you keep the record of wrongs, you have become a slave to your record. And you have become a hateful, bitter person full of malice. Now, this is tough teaching. This is tough love. If you have a record of wrongs, it will control you the rest of your life if you don't deal with it at the cross. And Jesus is the only one who can help you get rid of that list. You've got to take it with him and nail it to the cross and say, penalty has been paid. Justice has been met. I don't have to have it my own way, in my own time. I don't have to mistreat this person back who has mistreated me. I don't have to strike back to the person who's taking me to court, 1 Corinthians. I don't have to strike back at the man who is unlawfully with his father's wife, incest. I don't have to. No, I can let people go. I can forgive them from the heart. Then I'm patient. I'm other-centered. I can take the ussy and not have to be in the middle. I keep him as selfless. The picture, finally, is this. Love cuts people free and gives people a break, which is what you would like to have done for you. As I recall, that was Jesus' statement. Do to others what you would like them bless you. Do to others, I would love somebody to bless me, so do to others what you would have them do to you. Now, I don't know. Some people find this a good rule to live by. Others think it's golden. I think it's right. Do to others what you would want them to do to you. Seek to be proactive in being a putter-upper with patient, looking for good things to say about people, not negative, kind, not keeping a record of wrongs and holding people to their past, forgiving, not rejoicing with evil, but rejoicing with the truth, God-centered. Not arrogant or bragging, not jealous. Free with the security that I have the full value of Jesus Christ. Last point. You have the full value of Jesus Christ. He paid the price for you. He died on a cross for you. And I'm here to tell you, that's how much you're worth. You are worth the life of Jesus. That sets you free. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 is only possible because of the death and resurrection of Jesus. Because he gives me full value. Who can, who can give me greater value than the life of Jesus? And isn't that what he said at the cross? I look to God and I say, God, how much am I worth to you? And he said, I'll pay for you. Great, what's the price? The death of my son Jesus will buy you back. God, I'm not worth the life of Jesus. Don't argue with me. I know how much you're worth, and I'm not going to pay more for you than you are worth. You are worth the life of Jesus, and I'll pay that price because I want you. The life of Jesus is how much you're worth. You were that valuable. 
Does that give you any sense of security? If it doesn't, you're not working on this concept enough. This is reality. You're worth the life of Jesus, and how much more committed to you? How can anyone express greater care than to die for you? Listen, the cross of Jesus is the answer to how do you apply 1 Corinthians 13, but not just, he loved me that much, I better love you. He loved me that much, and he lives in me. And now I can love you, and you can love me even me. And you can love each other. And you can love the most despicable person who has hurt you so deeply that you think you'll never recover. You think you'll never get better. It's possible. Because love bears all things. Hopes all things. Believes, trusts all things. Love never fails. So these three remain. Faith, hope, love. The greatest of these. Father in heaven, so much left to be said and so much left to be done. So shallow to try to cover something that is so infinite. And I feel extreme, extremely inadequate. And the least of the people here to even talk about this, because I fail so often. But I ask you, Lord, to help us to be more patient with ourselves. Help us to be very forgiving of ourselves, to be kind to ourselves, to not keep a record of wrong of ourselves. But when you have forgiven when you've established our value and your commitment to us, that we bathe in that. You've lavished your love. Not just a little bit, not by a dropper. You put us in the center of the ocean of your love. So, Lord, I ask that you overwhelm us today with a great sense of how important we are to you, how valuable we are, and how committed you are. Thank you. Help us to live what we've been studying. In Jesus' name, amen. Lord, reign in me. If that's your desire, I'd love to see you respond this morning. Let's stand and sing.